is uh, I'm, I'm recording the, uh, the um, this webinar right now is we'll go ahead I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, I'm gonna share my screen and go into the um, the PowerPoint presentation and um, so and I'm gonna shut this door we have, a, have some vehicles outside but um, as I mentioned the the main house restoration um, occurred between um, uh, 2002 uh, uh, to about 2006. And um, what I'm going to do before getting into this is just check to um, make sure we don't have anybody else coming in. Looks like we're, we're good. So, um, but for the, for the main house restoration, during the restoration, we, um, they, we went from a 55-room DuPont house down to a 33 room main house uh, and during the restoration process what we did was you know do very uh careful deconstruction of the house uh you know over a period of about four years and it was that deconstruction process that allowed us to figure out what the main house looked like during the madison era and so while a lot of the work was involving the uh you know the first and second floors of the house and a lot of a lot of the architectural work was what was used to um figure out what the what the house looked like we also did a lot of archaeology and the cellars and the portico and so throughout during the entire restoration what our what the archaeology team was involved in was careful excavation of the cellar spaces and the uh and the portico and the front portico, um, we did uh, um, about three years of excavations under the front portico and uh, not only excavated under the, the roof line of the portico, but also around the perimeter of the portico. And as I'll detail in a second, there was a, made a lot of discoveries about the appearance of the main house. So it was it, the archaeology that we did informed um, not just the use of these spaces, but also uh, everything from the column renderings to the grade around the house. And then the basement, in some ways, was even more spectacular because of the preservation that was in this space. We excavated every inch of the Madison era cellar and in the process made all kinds of discoveries uh, regarding the enslaved community and their work and, and in some cases, the folks that were living there. I'm going to go back and check and see if we have anybody else. Yeah, we have Karen. I'll add Karen in here. Um, so I'm going to periodically check to make sure I'm not missing any anybody. If um, so, for the um, for the uh, the portico to begin with, though, one of the things that we um, we figured out with the portico is uh that the grade during the madison era was about um uh three feet higher than it was uh during the uh um uh during the early during during the during the during the uh 20th century the late 19th and early 20th century this line right here that says 1808 through 2008 ground level that was the grade around the main house when we started um our uh, work on the restoration and what we found when we did the excavations is there was a, um, a strike line for the mortar that showed where the, uh, the, the late 18th, early 19th century grade was. And in the process of excavating this area, what we discovered was that um, uh, in 1848 is when the grade was lowered around the main house. And when they lowered the grade around the main house, this is when they stuck out the house. Um, this is after Dolly Madison sold the property. And when they lowered the grade around the main house, what they did was they lowered the columns, the bases of the columns, to that uh, lower, new lower grade. And in the process of doing this, there was this accumulation of architectural debris under the portico. Um, I'm going to quickly switch back just for one second to see if anybody's joined. It looks like we're still good with uh, with participants. Um, so what we what we excavated under the portico was basically about a, a, a foot and a half of accumulated deposits that were from this late 1840s remodeling of the house when the house was stuccoed. They trimmed the columns down. All that material uh, fell down onto the what was the uh, uh, the floor of the portico, underneath the portico, then a layer of clay was put down, and it turns out this layer that's shown as layer C right here, 
this clay is the the surrounding grade around the main house that was taken down to bring the driveway up to the front of the house for um not sure how many of you all remember what the house looked like in 2002 but the driveway used to come right up to the front of the portico and then after that that clay was used to level out the surface under the portico what they did was put a brick paving underneath that and that brick paving is what existed there from the 1840s all the way up until 2004 when we started our excavations. So what we found when we excavated this, you know, the, the, the brick, uh, brick paving, the clay fill in this area and all this brick rubble is we we're actually able to find the, um, the bottom portion of the Madison era portico, co uh, portico columns. And we use those, the pieces from those columns to actually reconstruct what these columns used to look like. So, for example, these uh, pieces, these torus bricks that we found that are from this part of the, um, the top of the, the base of the uh, portico columns, these were all in this rubble layer that was in this. In fact, you can see, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow right here, but it's pointing to one of these torus bricks. And so we use these to not only understand and reconstruct what the brick columns looked like, but also all the, the plaster that was under the portico was the renderings from the columns. And we were able to use that to establish that the columns were rendered, there were brick columns that were rendered with, with stucco, and then that they were whitewashed. And so the whitewash you see in the portico today, that was from the actual rendering that we found underneath the, uh, underneath the portico. So, and portico is incredibly important for helping us understand, you know, what happened in the 1840s, what the Madison house looked like in the 18 teens. But at the, the same time, all this linked in with um, the work we did two years later in the front yard to understand how the, um, the old Madison road used to uh, come up, you know, further away from the house. So all these excavations were, were linked. Now, I'm going to jump back to see if anybody else has joined. It looks like LaToya. I'm going to add you in, LaToya. And uh, thanks for being patient and waiting, LaToya. Um, so with the, with the front portico, we've got about, um, uh, about 30 units that we excavated in the front portico, but it was incredibly you know, complex stratigraphy. In the cellar spaces, we um, spent um, about... Uh, three years in the cellars excavating this entire space. So uh, what happened under the portico is, or under the in, in the cellar spaces is following our, following our excavations, there is all the utilities, especially the ductwork, was installed in the floor of the cellar spaces. And this allowed basically the undergrounding of all the utilities so that the cellar spaces could be restored to their Madison era appearance. And today that's where the exhibit mere distinction of color um, uh, is, is placed. And instead of having a whole bunch of utilities running through the space, we could actually restore it. But before running all the utilities, we had to do, do the excavations um, uh, in the cellar. And what we had to do, this, the shot that's in the lower right hand corner, that shows the, uh, um, the archway. And many of you all have been to the exhibit will recognize this arch. That's where the um, uh, the display of artifacts is today. It looks like a um, an old fashioned uh, radio uh, curved radio. That's there's a, a artifact display also with screens. This is a relieving arch, but across the port across the cellar floors, the Duponts in 1908 had their workers pour a concrete floor. So we jackhammered through that floor, and um, with once we removed all that concrete. What we found was these intact Madison era features that had basically been entombed in 1908 when this concrete floor was poured. So this was incredibly valuable for preserving all the 19th century features that was uh, that were in this um, in this space. And some of the things that we found were everything from subfloor pits that were in the cellar, which are these ash pits that Megan Vanessa has shown here excavating. This is in this area right here in the 1797 room. Um, what we're able to figure out about these ash pits is they were used for um, storing uh, hearth ash for for use as both a, as a cleaner, but then also because you can scrub pots with them. Also, they could use you know, the enslaved community use this for making soap or lye. And then we also found that um, the ash was used to put into rodent runs to get rid of the get rid of the rodents. 
For those of you all that worked at the field quarter, you might recognize that we found these ash-filled subfloor pits there as well. We're thinking that in the field slave quarter and potentially in the cellar as well, these ash-filled pits were used for storing sweet potatoes. There's a West African tradition of, ro of rolling your sweet potatoes in ash, and that um, protects them from insect infestation. So they, the enslaved community might have been storing vegetables in these as, these as well. Uh, and the other thing, you know, the in, we are, found evidence for all the floor surfaces. In this case, in Dolly's kitchen, this is a shot so, showing the, the herringbone brick impressions that we found underneath the concrete in Dolly's kitchen. But but the excavations in the cellar, what they were really important at doing was helping us understand the use of these spaces. In some cases, like in Dolly's kitchen and also Nellie's kitchen, the architecture really gave us an understanding of how these spaces are being used. For example, the hearth, as well as the uh, the oven and the set kettle that you can see here, those indicated that this was a kitchen as originally built. But some of the other spaces, like the 1797 room, the wine cellar, and the 1760 room, weren't necessarily, there, there's no architectural evidence that jumped right out to say how these spaces were used. What we found in the 1797 room, as well as the 1760 room, is that we were finding, we started finding domestic material, uh, um, edge, bits of eggshell, animal bones, ceramics, glass, very tiny fragments that indicated the enslaved community were actually living in these spaces in addition to performing tasks. One thing that was very unique about the wine cellar is in the excavations there, there are absolutely no artifacts whatsoever. And that indicated that was a closed off and secure space that was not used for daily activities, but was used for storage. And of course, this is the room where uh, the film Fate in the Balance is shown today. But that door that's on there, that was one of the indications that it was the secure room because it had, had a massive uh, stock lock on it. The, the 1760 room, which is the one that um, has the uh, um, the archaeological display in it today, this one had um, also had uh, ash pits as well, as well as what in the time period was called a servant's room that had a uh, um, had a, a had a hearth um, located in it. And finally, uh, Nellie's kitchen was another another area that we excavated. Nellie's kitchen is the one that had the um, the uh, the uh, workout pit that um, uh, um, Randolph Scott used. And you'll see with the excavation records from Nellie's Kitchen that there was a large portion of that had been disturbed in, 19, 19, in the 1930s with the excavation of that pit. But basically everything else was intact. You know, the surfaces were intact from the Madison era. So these were incredibly important for understanding, you know, how these spaces were used. and. Today, uh, you know, much of these records are, um, are uh, and I'm going to stop sharing the screen right now, where, where, where a lot of these records are now today are in on paper form. So you can see, um, uh, can you all see the, am I back on the camera screen? I'm going to, um, Mike, I'm going to move you down to. Um, we can see it well, man. Okay, see now, okay. What a, a lot the records for the mansion restoration right now, they're either in paper form that we've scanned, and these are some of the things that we're going to have you all relabeling, or the photos, well, they're digital photos, they're photos that aren't tied to the actual unit records. So they're, uh, you know, trying to access any of this information is uh, you have to be present here at Montpelier. So what we've got, we've just received a grant from uh, from IMLS to actually uh, digitize all this into a, uh, a model of the main house. And one of the things that made the mansion restoration, uh, and this is this model that's on the screen right now. Um, what, uh, let me make sure I'm still screen, um, uh, oh, share the screen. Yeah, the, the model that's right here is a model that we actually uh, created during the mansion restoration. It was a uh, a CAD model that um, as we performed investigations of the main house, we put all of our drawings in a CAD drawing. 
And then about a, a year and a half later, after the restoration, all these, all these drawings were compiled into a 3D model that UVA did for us, University of Virginia, their um, in, um, uh, um, Institute for Adva Advanced Spatial Technology did this for us. And, or I have Institute for Advanced Technology and Humanities did this for us. And for years, this model has sat on a, a server at UVA and has not been able to be accessed. There is a, originally it was accessed through a website that UVA had, but the license they had for the software expired, uh, which is Unity. And so it has not been available. And what we're doing with the IMLS grant is taking this CAD model and putting it into GIS. And GIS is geographic information systems that allow you to attach data to entities in a model. So uh, you can attach information to windows, to doors, to rooms, to, in, in our case, attach them to excavation units. And then you can explore this model by, instead of having to go through um, uh, directories uh, or, or paper records, you can actually go into this model and explore uh, uh, the, the main house virtually. And so I've got an example of this. The, um, uh, let's see, so I'm still sharing here. This is the, the model right now that um, is in GIS. The uh, uh, University of Arkansas is converting this model for us, and they've started on this. What they've done is they've taken the, uh, the CAD drawing and they're beginning to make it into a 3D model. Angie Payne, who's the one of the other leads for the project, she's in the process of converting the CAD model into a uh, model in GIS. And what's great about GIS, we use a program called um, ArcPro, which is a Esri product. Once you have this in GIS, you can put this on the web. So this model, you can see from my screen right here, this is on on the web, and this can be explored, um, you know, just like uh, you know a model that you'd have in, in a piece of gaming software. Angie has asked me not to release this to the public yet because you can see it's in pretty primitive form right now. For example, the front portico is missing its columns. There's no windows or doors, so it's a work in progress. But Angie said that I could show this for the uh, webinar today. But what we what we do inside this model, though, is we also have a map of all the archaeology. And this is we, we've got a, a we've got a, a map that we um, initially brought in from uh, from CAD. And what our staff is doing right now is taking all the the records that we have from the, from the stratum cards, but then also from the plan views and digitizing these to make them more exact to these 3D walls. So what eventually we're going to have is a model, uh, you know, a 3D model of all these features that a user can go in and explore and look at. So they can, you know, click on a unit and then begin to bring up some of the uh, the records that are attached to it. And an easier way to look at this is what we're our active IMLS grant map right now. I've switched screens. This is a this is a uh, um, a uh, um, a map that I've shared with you already. This is the um, the ArcView uh, map. And what you can do is when you look at this, you can see the different project areas. Uh, we've got the 1760 cellar, the wine cellar, the 1797 cellar, and the portico area, as long as about three other areas. And as you zoom into this, what starts appearing is all the units. And when you get to, say, for example, unit 600, when you click on this, what the, what the program allows you to do is to scroll through and start to look at the records that are attached to this uh, particular unit. For example, this is under under the portico. This shows the uh, the bricks after they've been excavated for the 1848 uh, paving, coming down to that clay feature, that clay layer that was the clay that was brought from the front of the house underneath the portico to raise the grade, and then you get down into the brick rubble. And then finally into some of the uh, the features of the uh, the front portico. So what the the project and this is shows some of these uh, post holes uh, that we found under the portico. If we get to um, the finished ones, it looks like this one shows the top of the feature. And if I click on this, you can see not only the 
the excavation, uh, the, the excavation shot, but also the stratum card. And if you click on this, it brings up the stratum card and then also the actual ex the a shot of the excavation unit. So what we're doing with the um, with the uh, the data entry project that we're uh, getting you all involved in is actually going through these records and labeling these with their unit number and their strata letter. And in the end, what we'll have is all these units will have uh, um, the, these data records attached to them. And so if we had a researcher that wanted to study, for example, the subfloor pits that are in the 1790 cellar, seven cellar, instead of having them come here to look through our records, what they'd be able to do is we'd be able to send them the map, you know, that um, we're working on through IMLS uh, on the web and they could click on the uh, the records and actually go through and see, you know, some of the, the shots of the um, of the excavation unit. So, for example, this right here is the strat card from the excavation of this subfloor pit. And then when you look at the photo, here's the bisect of this subfloor pit with these other features that are in here. Now, right now, this this web map is a little clunky and it's because we're just in the first month of this of the grant what we're going to eventually do is not only have all the records you know inputted into this web map but then what we're going to be able to we're going to be able to start to do is create what are virtual exhibits from all the data records and be able to show for example a digitized version of this entire floor with all the features in a 3d format and so this is where University of Arkansas is working on some methods for us to model um, some of the some of the key portions of the stratigraphy and some of the key models to be able to present this um, in this 3D model. So essentially what we'll end up with is this map hybridized into this 3D model. And part of this is also going to be you know, um, uh, the visitor will, will not only be able to explore the, the uh, cellar spaces in the portico, but then also be able to walk through the first floor and the second floor and explore some of the, the excavations that were done by the architects of the discoveries that were made of various windows, of doors, of walls. So this is going to be a pretty massive database. But what's exciting about it is, you know, not only will everything be online, but everything for the more advanced users who want to really dive in, all this will be accessible through this model. But then again, what we'll be able to do is make um, uh, more um, uh, curated exhibits that focus on aspects of, you know, what, what evidence we found of slaves daily lives through these subfloor pits or in the case of the first and the second floor areas where you know du the DuPonts had their workers move windows from one side of the house to the other side and walk people through what the evidence was for the discovery of these uh, the, the this Madison and, and enslaved community history, but also use that for a way to teach people how to begin to use this model to really explore it or on their own. Because once once we have all these records in the uh, in the model, what someone will be able to do, a user will be able to do is say, do a search on uh, any, you know, do a search on all the subfloor pits that were found during this restoration and they, they would be able to appear on a list and they'd be able to click through them. Or in the case of um, incorporating the artifacts into this, they can do a search on all the artifacts that were found in the cellar and say, look for those units that had um, had uh, um, lighting influence in them. So, exa for example, we found a um, a uh, um, a part of a uh, of a of a candlestick in this subfloor pit that's right here in the uh, the 1765 um, uh, cellar. So basically, once we have all this data online, really the possibilities are endless for you know exploring the data that's here. Now, where where you all come into this is we've begun to put all these records into uh, into our um, into our Google Drive and have and have shared this with you all. So um, what we um, there's a document that I sent you all that is the unit uh, naming record. And let me switch back to this to make sure there's no one else that's added in. Um, Mike, are we good so far with everybody being able to hear and see the, the PowerPoint? Yeah, as far as I can see in here, Matt, it is. Okay, yeah. sounds good. 
Well, what I'll do is I'll start getting into um, some of the unit uh, uh, record uh, naming. I'm not going to, you know, read this verbatim. You all can look at this on your own. But basically, what I've done is uh, what we've done is created a uh, a unit um, uh, a, a unit record naming uh, um, a guide for our volunteers to use, where they can go into the um, the records that are on, Go on the Google Drive and begin to relabel these. So, for example, I'm going to go to Nellie's Causeway here, and in Nellie's Causeway. What we've got is uh, first on the on the at the base uh, um, uh, folder. This is a folder that shows all the different areas that we've got: Nellie's Causeway, Dolly's Kitchen, Nellie's Kitchen, the 1760 cellar. This corresponds to the GIS map that I've sent you all that shows where all these areas are. So, for example, in uh, Dolly's Kitchen, if we zoom into Dolly's Kitchen. You can see there's a uh, unit 1075. So if we go to the folder here and go into Dolly's kitchen and we go to 1075, what we'll see is, and I've just selected this one randomly. It's probably the most uninteresting unit here, but, um, you can see here's a record of the excavation. So this is the, um, the, what we call the, the, the base of the concrete or the farmer's cement. Once all the, the, the concrete was jackhammered off. When we excavated that, we got down to this clay surface, which was the dirty subsoil. And in excavating that, that's when we started coming across features. So let's go back to this grant map and actually find something that's a little more interesting. 1057 um, actually has some of these, um, these brick impressions. Let's look at this one. So... So here, this is the, the, uh, the, the base of the concrete when we jackhammered the concrete off. This is the, uh, the, the initial, once we took all that sand off. And then when we started excavating it, we started to find these, started to find linear, um, uh, patterns. And at one point in excavating it, we started seeing these areas that were a little shinier. And we did a raking light. We started realizing these were the brick impressions from, from when, there was a brick floor in the kitchen and the DuPont workers took that brick floor up and this left these brick impressions and then they poured the concrete on top of this and it basically preserved all these brick impressions in place. And so we've got the drawings that go with this, but when you go back to some of these others, this is the kind of the, uh, the more uh, glamorous shot here with everything cleaned up and you can see, you know, the results of these excavations. So prior to this project, none of this was available online for the public. And what you all are going to be doing with relabeling these is you'll actually, in many ways, be able to be, take part in a virtual dig. Well, you'll be able to go through each of these units and in the process of relabeling it, you know, understand, you know, what our discoveries are made. And then as we complete, you know, folders in the process of doing this, what we're going to do is if we go to uh, let's see, go to Nellie's Causeway. I think that one is, uh, is done. What we've got with Nellie's Causeway is this is a list of all the completed units from Nellie's Causeway. So when you go into this, what you'll see is all of the unit, all these, the unit records, both the photographs, but then also the drawings and the, and the cards. But all these are labeled with their unit number, the strata, and then what kind of record it is. And in the case of this one, this is a, a photo of Strata A, and then this is the plan view of Strata A. And when you click on this, you can see that, you know, um, you know, identify what these records are. But what we're able to do is once we have these, these, um, these unit records labeled, we can extract the file name, which is, in this case, is MT990, which is the unit Strata A, uh, which is the strata of excavation, and then the record type, in this case, is photo, what we can do is we can extract that file name and build a table of all these records that has the, the unit number, the uh, stratum, what type of record it is, and then create a link to this particular record, and then link all this to the IMLS map so that when we get you know, over here in... Um, in uh, Let's see, this was Nellie's Causeway Unit 1990. 
Once we have it all linked and we have it linked to the map, when you click on this record right here, there'll be about um, five records that'll appear because there are five stratums in MT990. And you can basically click through these records and look at you know all the record all the data records that are associated with it. So what uh, um, we're what we've done for the project, and this is getting into the, the nitty-gritty here, is we've got a whole flow chart for you know what's taking place with the uh, with the with the project. We're you know we've gotten all the, the, the files scanned, we're, we've got them into uh, unit folders, and then what we're starting to do is you know get this is where you all are is you know volunteers relabeling the strata files. Then once we're download these to Google folders, we're going to create the tables that allow it to link to the map. And what we're doing right now is, you know, bringing all the, the records, especially the, um, the, the data, data entering the records, so that we'll end up creating this model that will be able to be on the web. And then the end product is to create these web maps that, um, that visitors, you know, the web visitors can actually use. So what I'll do um, right now is I'm going to um, uh, go back to the uh, um, uh, to, the, to the screen here. Can everybody see me now? Thumbs up on that. Um, what what we'll do is I'll open it up for uh, for questions, and um, you can if you want to ask a question, you can go ahead and turn off your mic. We'll talk in general about um, you know have any questions about the excavations that we do, we've done or the general project, and then when, when we're done with that, those of you all that have started to do, to do some of the unit relabeling, what we'll do is we'll have a a more um, specialized session after this, where if you have questions about what you've been relabeling, we can answer those in this live session. So I'll, I'm gonna give my voice a break and let you all ask some questions if anybody has any. Matt? Yeah. Uh, Bob Arnett, I, I have a question. Uh, I, I, how, how do you manage quality control, quality assurance on this? And like, you know, is this Mike's role to assign people to various folders, or you know, how do I know I'm not working on the same folder as someone else, and those kind of things? That's that's a good question. I'm going to go back to sharing the screen, Bob, and I'll show you what how we do that. Basically, yes. My, Mike is the um, is the the uh, the team leader for doing the relabeling, and he's the one that is you know will be able to answer questions about um, about what priorities are, and then also questions about you know processes of relabeling. But for the units, when you're in, for example, uh, in Nelly's Causeway, uh, in this particular folder. You'll see that, for example, um, you've got a completed folder. This folder right here are all the units that are complete. These, when you click on any of these right here, there's no file names that are the um, that are uh, random. They're they're all have the unit the MT unit number. If you go into, for example, um, uh, the problems folder, the problems folder, what this has is um, uh, these are these are units where there is a um, particular file that people had questions on, and I'm looking at this. It looks like all oh, is this is relabeled. Let me go to one an actual example. So MT403. Tell you what, I'm going to go to um, Jolly's Kitchen. When you when you look, when you, when you first open up a folder that has not been a unit folder that's not been labeled, the unit names are the um, uh, the names that the camera gave it, or the company that did all the scanning gave it. So they're they're you know nonsensical names. Like this is Strat Card one through six. This is Graph Paper one through uh, three, and then these are DSCN numbers. Um, when you're in this in this folder and you're relabeling it. What you do is you rename it, uh, and you put in in progress IP, and I'll put MBR. And when you go to Dolly's Kitchen, what you'll see is this unit right here has my this initials on it. That means I'm in here relabeling it. And so you wouldn't want to. You can go into any of these folders right here because there's nobody's initials there. 
But in this case, I'm actively relabeling this one. And I'm going to go back and rename this guy. Um, so it's free again. But again, a lot of this is described in this uh, u this uh, unit recorded unit record naming uh, uh, document. So for those of you all that are new to this, if you give this a read, you can um, uh, you know get some of the details on this. I'll go back to hey Matt. Yeah. So um, go back into the Google Drive and look in Nellie's Causeway. Yeah. And well, actually, before we, we get to go too deep of a dive into the unit relabeling, I'll do a, do a public service announcement. Um, what will does anybody have any questions on, you know, the, the project in general, like what the, the outcome of the project project is going to be? Any questions on the specifics of the excavations that we did, you know, in the portico and the cellars or anybody have any uh, you know, I can direct you all to some of the um, reports that we've got on the on these these project areas as well. Hi, Matt. It's Wendy. Uh, just a quick question: When when is the timing for us to get started on it, and what is the projected time frame that you want to try to have it completed in? Um, the you folks can start on the unit relabeling immediately. What we ask you to do is to read the uh, the unit uh, record renaming naming guide and uh, actually even before you do that what you should do is anybody that's interested in taking part in this drop me an email and then what I'll do is I will uh, um, give you permissions for the folders digitally introduce you to, to, to Mike um, via email and then we'll add your name to the list of folks that, that can access the unit relabeling guide, and then all the, the folders as well. And then the next step would be actually going into the record unit record guide and actually reading that. And what, what I'll what I'll do is I'll send after this um, meeting is over, I'll send um, uh, email out to everybody describing what the steps are to become part of the unit relabeling team. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody else have any general questions? Cool. Mike, do you want to say anything about the um, the unit relabeling project? Just that I think it's important that <clears throat> if you feel like you want to participate, you should examine that unit relabeling document carefully because it's um, it's very specific on um, the naming conventions and punctuation and stuff. So. That's all designed so that these uh, images and uh, documents um, wind up when they're all in, when they're all taken into a to a single entity that they're they are interleaved correctly. Yeah, and we can, we can get into the specifics now of the of the project. Um, one Matt, of the, yes, a point of clarification: the document you're referencing is that actually entitled "Unit Record Naming." Dash pre two thousand eight units. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, one one thing that um, people are often concerned about that the you know folks that have been doing this so far. We we um, uh, last or two weeks ago during our uh, lab expedition, we used that lab expedition. The participants for half a day or a whole day as guinea pigs to begin to relabel some of these units, and what people got very concerned about is relabeling things incorrectly and what we figured is the best solution for this is if you get to a unit record and it's not clear how to relabel it is just don't relabel it that we have a document in each folder where you can put your uh the questions that you have and mike will go through that and start compiling questions that are the same that might lead to you know um uh you know helping you understand how to how to relabel something or to actually make changes to how we're labeling things. But the most important thing is if you do have questions is basically is to don't change the name of the file. And then when you've relabeled what records you can, they're more obvious. 
take that unit folder and scoot it over to uh, the problems folder. So what we're expecting is with this project is there's going to be a lot of, most units are going to end up in the problems folder. And despite the name of that being a problem, it's not a problem. It's actually a good thing. Uh, probably we're, we've estimated about 80% of the photos and records are fairly obvious and can be easily relabeled, but there's about 20% that are, there's, there, you're going to have questions on. So don't hesitate to put those into the, um, into the problems folder. And then, uh, Mike has, uh, has, what he does is he's, he has everybody, um, initial, uh, their, um, unit that has a problem. And, um, he, that'll help him be able to, you know, track down people to be able to answer questions they might have. So does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And it was uh, two weeks ago that the, the, um, the, um, expedition was very helpful to, to clarify some of this. And what we're going to be doing, um, over the next, uh, three to four months is during expeditions on the, the, fr the lab day, the Friday, we're going to, um, get people, you know, behind the computer for two or three hours labeling units. And hopefully you can get some more people involved in this project as well as we go through the expedition season. And for those of you all that haven't come on a program yet, actually coming on a program and taking part in the excavations is a huge help for understanding what all these records are, because a lot of these records are very similar to what we use today. Hey, Matt. Yeah. This is Dean. I have, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, about the, you know, uh, the unit strata versus the feature strata. And just, you know, the instructions are actually uh, the unit uh, record naming instructions are fairly clear on this, but I'm just thinking that maybe when I get to doing these, I may, I may uh, have some questions then. I don't know. I haven't done them yet. But if you could just sort of elaborate a little bit. I mean, you know, uh, in previous re relabeling that I have done, we haven't really, I, I didn't have to deal with, or I don't remember dealing with feature strata, but, uh, you know, where you've got MTXXX dot, you know, mm -hmm. F with the strata, and uh, then you have a, a, you know, A, B, C, D, as opposed to, you know, a, a typical unit strata. I don't know if I'm making myself clear or not here, but. No, I know what you mean, Dean. For that, before 2008, uh, what, how we excavate today is every single strata, whether it's a, a, a strata that goes across the entire five by five unit, or it's a strata that's in a feature, gets its own unique letter that runs A through, you know, Z. And then uh, later on, we'll assign feature numbers to those features. How we did it before 2008 is say you're excavating, excavating a strata and um, you, the first two layers were went all the way across the unit. Those would be called A and B. And then you come across a post hole. That post hole, that little round feature would be given a feature number. And then the, the, the stratum letters would start all over again with a little a. So the post hole would be excavated. And so maybe it was taken down six inches as, uh, as a uh, feature, um, 59a. And then if there was a post mold found, you'd change strat cards and that post mold would be called F59b. And then the rest of it would be excavated as C. What we're doing is we're treating the feature number and the strata letter all as a strata designation. Be and, and so that helps us organize the records and all those are separated by dots. Um, and in some cases, there are some features in the cellar that were, um, uh, for example, stake holes. So I'm gonna share screens again and go to the IMLS, uh, this IMLS grant map if you look at, um, oh, I know this, um, the, the subfloor pit right here. Let me see. Um, yeah, this is the record right here. This, um, feature right here is feature, uh, 492. That's a little stake hole. This one actually got a letter because it's part of it. But in a lot of cases, these little stake holes wouldn't even get a letter. So if it was a, um, 
one of these little stake holes that are, say, for example, in the wine cellar, these guys, these only had one layer in them. So it would, it would just be called F25 with no strat layer. And so that, you know, gets a little bit confusing, but you just treat that as a strata. Does, does that make sense? It's, it's hard to describe this without, you know, actually. Just yeah, uh, it, it's making sense. I'll, you know, I think as I work with it, it'll, uh, you know, it'll become clearer. Right? At least I hope so. <laughs> yeah. So actually I can go to, um, I'm going to share screens again. And I'll go, let me look up one of these. So um, 937, and this is in the wine cellar. So we'll go to, that was, yeah, 937, 937. So um, I'll, I'll zoom in here. So feature 373, one of these little stake holes. Yeah. So these guys right here don't well, only didn't have only had one strata in them. So when they were excavated, they didn't come across another strata. So it was just called F 730, uh, 372. And that's in the stratum field. So that's it's instead of being layer A or B or C, it's just called F. 372. And actually, I just remembered this. When you go um, to these uh, um, uh, in individual um, project folders, there is a, a Google Sheet that has all the proveniences that are here. So when you go down, I'm still sharing screens. When you go down and look at um, MT 937, 937, yeah, so this one, um, there's what the provenience was on the cards and then the provenience in Google. So this, how the provenience will be listed is F371, and then it's the unit. 937. So this is actually the beginning of that file name. That fi the file name for that one photo for 371 would be MT 937.F371 and then uh, uh, .ph for photo or um, CA for card. Yeah, PH for photo and then um, Let's see, uh, where's, where's card? Yes, yeah, CA for card. So. Okay, thank you, Matt. Yeah, no problem, Dean. Yeah, the best thing to do is just start going in and, and uh, looking at the, uh, you know, read the unit record naming. Um, and, that, and one thing to let you all know, I, you should print that out again because I uh, changed that just this morning and I get rid of some of the old stuff in that. So if you printed it out, it'd be good to print it again today. Um, and uh, what I'll do is if I make any changes to the unit um, uh, naming form, what I'll do is I'll put track changes on so you can see what the, um, uh, I'll go from editing to suggesting and then you can see what, where I've made changes. So it'll make it a little more transparent. Matt, this is Kathy. Can I okay. ask? You? Okay, because I was actually looking and playing. We said we could play in one of the units before we started. Anyway, yeah. yeah. And the, one of the questions I have was um, uh, it doesn't quite address. You talk about if the unit, the picture you have has two unit numbers to it. Um, when I, you, say that again, Kathy. So you, you have a picture of a unit and it has two unit numbers, 985 and 986 together, okay? So when, what, uh, 985, do you remember what room that's in? 
Um, well, I, there might be one in, uh, I was in unit 405 in uh, Dolly's Kitchen. Okay, I'm gonna go to Dolly's Kitchen. I think there might be one there, but I'm not sure because when I was, we were there for the for the lab work and I was sitting with Hannah, she had told me, oh, we should make a duplicate of this and look for the nine, not the second unit number and put uh, a copy of that picture in the second unit number. And I, I don't see that in the unit right, record naming information. So I'm, I'm thinking, do we have to do that? No, I, yeah, that's a good question, Kathy. If there, if anything starts to get really complicated or convoluted, yeah. I would rather have that unit record not be relabeled and we'll deal with that on our end. Okay, because then at that point we made a duplicate and put it into the other unit and I thought that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> it seems like a lot of work and could get really confusing. It, the, the best thing to do would be if there's any questions, just put it in the problems folder. And then what we're, we'll deal with that on our end. You know, um, either Mike will know what to do with it, or Mike will call me and be like, Matt, there's five folders that have a bunch of things you need to deal with. Good luck. And then we'll deal with them. Okay. So what, what, when you were the, here, Kathy, I started trying to answer questions on a, on a case by case basis. And I started finding that I was being inconsistent in my answers and it, it really kind of scared me. So what I'd rather do is compile all the problems, you know, for a particular area, you know, have everybody go through all the units, put things in either completed or most of the cases in the problems, and then uh, deal with it all at once, because that way we can deal with it consistently. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. That was a real learning curve, and that's why it was great to have you all as guinea pigs for that, so. So, oh, great. Well, does anybody else have any other questions? I just, Matt, uh, Dean, I just have a quick question. Are there any crew photos in the in, in there anywhere that we have to figure out what to do with? Yeah, for the crew photos, um, what, uh, Mike, didn't we, we were going to make a crew folder, crew photos folder in each um, either area or unit? Yeah, that's correct. We're going to put a <clears throat> a crew photos folder in each in each um, major like Dolly's Kitchen or Nellie's Causeway or whatever, and then the crew photo would have the unit number and then a sequential number of uh, so it's the, the the unit designation MT XXX underscore crew shot and then um, a digit sequential digit crew crew shot one crew shot two. That but sounds great. Having a unit associated with it, we didn't start off doing that a few um, a few units ago, but we're doing that now. All right. Now, could you make a crew shot folder for each project area? Have I? No, or, or could you? Oh, absolutely. That'd be great because the nice the, with the crew shots. The problem with that is a lot of times you don't necessarily know what stratum it is, but it, but it's attached to a unit, or sometimes it's going to be that. It's a crew shot that is in a particular project area, but we don't know what unit it is. And then we'll put all that together. That'd be great. Yeah. Matt, I've got a question. Um, I know the, I was looking at the file the other day, but now I can't find it. Was it sent via email or how was that sent? Oh, the unit record naming? Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna right after I get off the um, this call. I'm gonna send an email out to everybody. Okay. That has, okay. Has, has the link to that file, and then um, right. what I'll do is um, um, probably what I'll do, Mike, is I'll, I'm gonna make a, um, a a Google Doc where everybody could add their name if they're interested in doing this. Then we can start adding people to the. Uh, um, to the permissions for for doing the unit relabeling. So why don't you have them add their name to that Google sheet that is uh, tracking hours? Oh, that's a, that's a great idea. All right, so I'll do that. I'll share the Google sheet for tracking hours. But you might want to touch on that as long as it came up. Yeah, let me go to screen sharing again. Um, 
So where that is, yeah. So at the base directory where the unit uh, record naming um, f file is, is there's a, a, a Google sheet called volunteer errors. And if um, uh, there's, a, for, there's a tab for hours and then there's a tab for volunteers. And if you all can add your name here, that'd be great. And and I'll send a, I'll send a link to that so it's it's uh, pretty obvious what to do. But they're going to have to have permissions in order to add their name to that file, right, Matt? Um, I can make that one that anyone has a link. Anyone that has the link can add their name to that. Okay. So I can I can do that. Um, Is that going to be a mnemonic device for you to know to add? to um, add, add their permission? Uh, yeah, I can make anybody with link can, um, can uh, comment. And with any of this, if, you, if anybody has problems getting a hold of a document, email uh, you know, Mike and he can give you permission for that. And I'm, I'm gonna send Mike's email. Is it right if I make your email public? Sure. Okay, Mike, would you want to be the uh, the Emmy Turner at Yahoo or your Google? Do the Yahoo one. Do the Yahoo one. Okay. I'm making a list of things to send out, and then the unit relabeling guide. But folks should also know that they're going to be. Working in Google Drive is going to be more um, less problematic if they have a Google ID. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, if you don't have a Google account, you should just create one, and um, uh, it doesn't cost anything to have a, a Google account. It's Gmail. It's a Gmail account. Yeah. And once you have that, you'll want to log in with that to go into the folders. Because you're right, Mike, so you, it's hard to get permission to, even if I, I remember when we started this, I tried to give you permission through Yahoo, and it just was not working. Well, it's great. I can see a list of our... Uh, the hardcore people that are staying on to listen and stick through all this. So, <laughs> Matt, I have a question. Yeah. The what is it was asked earlier, and I don't think you answered it. When do you want this done by? Oh yeah, I didn't answer that, Ed. Um, this this part of the project is hope. I'm hoping that we can get the cellars or the kitchens done over the next uh, two months. But then get the sellers done. That would put us near the near the end of the summer, and then the portico, uh, you know, then over the next six months. But you know, we're gonna go as slow or fast as the, as as you all can do it. Um, I mean, it's not a race. Want to do it carefully, but it's um, what we're able to do is we're we're able to work. Um, uh, parallel with what you all are doing because for example what um hannah and taylor are doing right now is they're digitizing all of the stratum cards uh and they're doing it from the the unrenamed um folders uh and they're they're adding all the stratum into the uh gis so when they're entering these unit stratum in right now there's no link to the unit, unit stratum photos, the unit stratum cards, or the unit stratum drawings. But as these areas get done, we're going to download these off of Google and then extract all the information out of the file names along with the links and then begin to attach that. And as we get rooms done, what we'll do is we'll make those public for you all to be able to see. And you can see, begin to see what some of the end results of this are. So we're, we're uh, by the time we get into May, like mid-May, Hannah and Taylor are probably going to be in the field full time. And then June, we have the field school. So they're going to take a hiatus from the project during that time until about uh, 
July when we um, uh, get back in and spend a week in the field and a week doing IMLS. All right. Well, thank you all so much for taking part in this um, webinar. Would love feedback. If you all have any suggestions like a, a better colored shirt or anything like that, let me know. Um, and uh, also, thanks for um, taking part in this project. What I'll do is I'm going to um, send an email, a mass email out to everybody. And then for those of you all that are interested in signing up for it, add your name to that volunteer um, uh, Google Sheet. And then I'll, as I, as those names come in, I'll introduce you to, uh, um, to, to Mike, and then we can get you all permission for getting into this and starting up the project. So, all right, well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, for your thanks time. man. I'm talking to you all. Thanks, thanks man. man. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.